Okay, so we will start a new chapter today, namely uh, the chapter on distributed deadlock detection. So to start with, let us first uh, see some examples of where we can have deadlocks in a distributed system. So typically a deadlock happens when there is a set of processes which are waiting for resources uh, which are currently being used by the other processes. So if you have a cyclic wait, then we know that there is a deadlock. So deadlock detection and deadlock recovery has been well studied in the uh, in the centralized or the or the single processor systems and in this chapter we are going to look at the distributed versions of those problems to start with let us look at one example where i have two transactions in a database management systems so the transactions are t1 and t2 So let us say that T1 wants to lock a particular data item, say it wants to transfer some amount of money from account A to account B, right. So it locks A, right, then it locks B. then it performs the transfer then it unlocks a it unlocks b okay. let's say that this is the order in which it does the things and let us look at what t2 does T2 wants to compute the sum of the balances of A and B. So let us say that it first locks B, then it locks A, then compute total balance, then we let us say that it unlocks A and then unlocks B. Okay. Now, if these two are two concurrent transactions, then it is possible that after this one is executed, so let us say this is the first thing to be executed and then let us say this is the second thing instruction to be executed. Then let us say after these two have locked A and B, now B, uh, T1 is waiting for locking B and T2 is waiting for locking A. So they are now in a deadlock, right. So this is the standard scenario where we observe that T1 and neither T1 nor T2 can progress because they need uh, locks on some items which are currently locked by other transactions and we have a cyclic wait condition that is T1 is waiting for T2 and T2 is waiting for T1, right. Now one good thing about a deadlock is that once the deadlock happens, it will stay. So it is not a phenomenon which goes away. So once a set of processes is deadlocked, it will remain deadlocked, right. So we can take our own sweet time to detect the deadlock. So in distributed deadlock detection, the problem is not in missing valid deadlocks because once there is a deadlock, it will be there. The problem is that we might detect false deadlocks, that is because we are not able to capture the global state of the system locally and while we are trying to find out who is waiting for whom, those dependencies are changing. So if I try to collect the information about who is waiting for whom in a distributed system and then plug it together, the, the problem is that I must make sure that the, the wait for cycle that I am getting 
is not a false one, right. So, that is the main problem which all of these algorithms will try to solve, okay. So, with that background, let us see that what are the different classes of distributed deadlock detection algorithms. So, yes. First, let us look at the system model. We say that the system has only reusable resources. So, a resource is used by somebody and then it can be reused by another process. Processes are allowed only exclusive access to resources. So, uh, resources are used one at a time by I mean the processes use the resource one at a time and there is only one copy of each resource that is what that is the model in which we will study these algorithms. And we are going to look at the graph theoretic model for this which is called a wait for graph and in the wait for graph there is an edge the vertices are the processes and there is an edge from, from process p i to p j if p i is waiting for some resource which is currently blocked by p j okay, then we have a edge from p i to p j that is the uh, semantics of the wait for graph. It is directed obviously. We are going to look at um, three different types of deadlock handling strategies. We will focus on only one of these, but let me uh, outline each of these. So, what we try to do in deadlock prevention strategies is that we will prevent deadlocks from happening, right. So, we will make certain rules in such a way that if you follow those rules, you will never have deadlocks. So, one rule could be that all the resources will have to be acquired at the beginning of the transaction, right. And we will acquire all those resources in a particular order. See, if you look at the example that we saw right here, in this example, you see A, this T1 wanted both A and B, but it locked A and then B. On the other hand, T2, which also wanted A and B, locked B first and then A. Suppose we say that this is not allowed. This one should also first lock A and then lock B. You see, if we impose this order, then these two will not deadlock. Why? Because first, in the second step, this one will get blocked here, but T1 will continue to lock B. So, it cannot happen that T2 has locked B and then T1 is waiting for that. So, if you impose a total order among the resources and impose the restriction that all processes must acquire the resources in that order and at the beginning of the transaction, then it is easy to show that we, you, you will not have deadlock, right. But this is a too restrictive assumption because a, 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 yeah, a, a transaction may not know at the beginning which items have to be locked, right. So, uh, the necessity that everything has to be locked at the beginning is a, is a major problem. And the other thing is that concurrency will be lost because it is quite possible that if you got one lock, then you can do some computation and then ask for the next lock. If you say that both of them have to be taken at the beginning, you will wait at the beginning of the transaction without doing that part which you could do by taking only one of the locks, right. So, for these reasons, the deadlock prevention strategies, they are not used very often. I mean, they are used in some pockets, but not the ones which are most well studied. So, that is about deadlock prevention. Now, deadlock avoidance, deadlock avoidance is a slightly different notion. So, in prevention, we put in rules in such a way that you can never have deadlock. So, after you have your rules for acquiring the resources are in place, you do not have to do any kind of analysis of the situation in which the set of transactions are. 
right. So, you, you, you are guaranteed that there will be no deadlock. Deadlock avoidance on the other hand does is not so restrictive, but so there is a possibility that deadlock can take place, but before allocating every resource you do an analysis to find out whether allocating this resource can lead to a deadlock, right. So, you remember banker's algorithm in operating system. So, banker's algorithm is an example of deadlock avoidance. There it is not it does not rule out deadlock, but before giving every resource it does an analysis to check whether by allocating this resource whether it is going to lead to a deadlock. If so, then it will not allocate that resource. Again you see deadlock avoidance is not very popular because in a distributed system because to avoid the deadlock you will have to understand the state of the system. Capturing the global state of the system is an expensive process in distributed systems. And before allocating every resource if you have to do that then that is a lot of overhead. So, that is why deadlock avoidance strategies are not at all popular in distributed systems, right. The last one that is deadlock detection works by allowing things to progress as it normally does and then when it suspects that the system might have deadlocks, then it initiates a deadlock detection algorithm, right. This is the most popular way of handling deadlock in distributed systems. The reason being that the actual happening of deadlocks, the actual deadlocks taking place is a rare phenomenon. So, it is not, uh, it is not something that happens all the time, right. And that is why it is better instead of trying to avoid deadlocks, you allow deadlocks to happen because anyway they are going to happen once in a while. And then when it happens then you detect the deadlock and preempt one or more of the processes so that the deadlock is broken, okay. And then those ones which are preempted they are aborted and the, those transactions are redone, okay. That is the way in which deadlock handling is done in most distributed systems. So, we are also going to focus mostly on deadlock detection and subsequent recovery from the deadlock. Is it clear? I mean the three different philosophies between the three different strategies and the one on which that we are going to focus on. Okay. So, the question is what is the difference between prevention and avoidance? In prevention the rules for acquiring the resources are made in such a way that if you follow those rules then you will never have deadlock, right. So, you do not have to examine the state of the system, you do not have to examine what the other processes are doing, which resources they have locked, you do not need to know that. All you know is if I follow this policy that I will acquire all the resources at the beginning and I will acquire them in this sequence and that is followed by everyone then you are guaranteed not to have deadlock. In deadlock avoidance it is not that, the rules are much more relaxed, but before allocating every resource you have to think that if I allocate this resource is it going to lead to deadlock. To answer that question I need to know what is the state status of the other processes, I need to know which process has acquired which resources, right. So, deadlock avoidance is more expensive than deadlock prevention, right. And deadlock prevention is more strict, so you have less of concurrency than deadlock avoidance, right. And deadlock detection, detection is the most relaxed one, you do not try to prevent anything, you do not want try to avoid the deadlock also. But when you suspect that there is a deadlock, then you initiate a detection algorithm and then if there is a deadlock you break it, okay. So, the issues in distributed deadlock detection is that 
first thing is that we should at some point of time suspect that there is no progress right and then initiate the deadlock detection algorithm right now when you initiate the deadlock detection al algorithm and if you find that the processes are being able to progress then you say that then there is no deadlock right we have to make sure that this decision is correct that is when we say that there is no deadlock then really there is no deadlock okay this is the easier part the harder part is to make sure that there is no false deadlock and once there is false uh, th there is uh, an algorithm to detect the deadlock and it detects a deadlock then we will have to start a resolution process to identify that which transaction will be aborted and then start the that transaction once again okay. so detection and resolution are two things which should be there there are broadly three types of deadlock detection algorithms the first category is centralized control where there is one process which will accumulate the information from all the other processes and then detect whether there is a deadlock the second one is distributed control where i will not gather the information from all the sites but i will initiate some kind of wave or traversal and that wave or traversal when it finishes will tell me whether there is a deadlock or not but even when i detect a deadlock i do may not know that in some other system which resources are being blocked by which process the initiator may not know that also at the end of the thing but the initiator will certainly know whether there is a wait for cycle and whether it itself belongs to that wait for cycle right so that it can abort itself and restart right so that's what we mean by distributed control the third category is hierarchical control where there is a hierarchy in which the deadlock detection takes place Th that's something we will take up only if we have time towards the end right so let us first look at the completely centralized algorithm in the completely centralized algorithm one process sends out requests to all the other processes to send their wait for statuses what is a wait for status which process has acquired which resources and which process is waiting for which resources this is the information it will collect from all the processes and then it will construct the global wait for graph and tr see whether that has cycled okay now it's easy to see that if we use the completely centralized algorithm then there is always a possibility of detecting false deadlocks now let's see an example of that suppose my transactions are like this i have t1 this one locks r1 then unlocks r1 then it locks r2 and then it unlocks r2 i am not writing the code which is between these where actual computation of the transaction takes place i am skipping that part and t2 does the following it locks r1 then it unlocks r1 then it locks r2 same thing same sequence but obviously they do different types of computation these are two transactions right now let's say that uh, so i have let me draw the stuff so i have t1 is one transaction t2 is one transaction 
let us say I have site S1 and I have site S2 and uh, I have resource R1 here in S1 and I have resource R2 in S2, right. And let us say that this is the initiator, the initiator process which is wanting to collect the global state, right. Now let us say that initially T1 does lock R1, okay. So R1 is locked by T1 and let us say at that time T2 also wants to lock R1, so it is waiting here, okay. At this point of time, the state of S1 is sent to I, okay. So when this one is sent to I, what does I know? I knows that T2 is waiting for T1 because there is this resource R1 which is locked by T1 and T2 is waiting for it, okay. So this is what I gets from S1, all right. Now let us say that immediately after this is sent, this T1 completes this, unlocks R1 and then T2 does that, unlocks R1. So at that point of time, both of them are done with R1. So this is gone, this is gone. And then let us say T2 first locks R2, okay. So R2 is locked by T2 and then T1 lock tries to lock R2 and therefore waits here, right. At this point of time, let us say the message from I requesting the status of S2 reaches S2. So S2 is going to return its current state and what is its current state? It will say that T1 is waiting on T2, right. Now what is I going to see? I will see that okay from S1 I got the information that T2 is waiting on T1 and S2 told me that T1 is waiting on T2, so it detects a cycle. But this is not a real cycle and the, this is not a real cycle because we got hold of these informations at two different times and it is not a global snapshot. So therefore we are ending up by getting a false deadlock. These false deadlocks we will refer to them by the term phantom deadlocks. So it detects this approach detects phantom deadlocks, right. Now then Ho and Ramamurthy, they proposed two algorithms. The first algorithm which they proposed is called the two-phase algorithm, okay. So what they suggested was that, okay. A deadlock, once it happens, it will remain, but all other acquiring of resources and releasing them will uh, change with time. So the two-phase algorithm says that why do not we do one thing, we collect this status twice. We will do it once and then we will do it again after some time right and we will only take those dependencies which are present in both, right. Now if there is some wait for cycle and that is an actual deadlock, then in this next second one also we will see that because it will be there. So if you see it into successive executions of the algorithm, then you declare the deadlock. Otherwise, it is not the deadlock is not there, right. Now, in our example, in our example here, uh, you see 
if I again do it, then next time I will find that this dependency is not there, right. So, I will say that this is not a deadlock, but is this algorithm still correct? No, it is not correct because what may happen is that everything completes and then again the same thing repeats itself and when you capture the snapshot the second time, you will get the same snapshot, right. So, therefore, the two phase algorithm of Ho and Ramamurti, it does not guarantee uh, that, that false deadlocks will not be detected. So, it is still prone to phantom deadlocks. The third, uh, the, the, so after finding out that this does not work, they also proposed another algorithm which is called the one phase algorithm. So, what we do in a one phase algorithm is that every node, every node will store two tables. One is called the process status table. right. What will the process status table contain? The process status table will contain this is the one phase algorithm that we are talking about. So, we will have the process status table and we will have the contains resources, the process status table contains resources that have been locked or Okay. So, in the process status table for every process we will have those resources that have uh, been sorry that have been locked by that process and the resources on which that process is waiting for. Okay. In the resource status table for each resource we have processes which is using the resource and processes waiting for the resource. Okay. All right. Now, once it gets this, so is it clear what is the process status table, what is the resource status table? So, what the centralized initiator will do is it will request both of these tables from all the sites and it will create the wait for graph by using these two tables from every site. Now, it will take, uh, so given a process Pi and a resource Rj, it will take this dependency only if the resource status table shows that Pi is waiting for Rj 
and the process status table also shows that PI is waiting for RT. Only then I will accept this dependency as a valid one, right? And by looking at only those valid dependencies, if I get a cycle in the wait for graph, then I will say that this is a deadlock, okay? And this algorithm guarantees that there will be no false deadlock, okay? Let us understand why, why does it guarantee that this is not going to be, uh, th there cannot be a false deadlock. No, 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 because you see the PI and RJ may not be in the same site. If PI and RJ are in the same site, then this entry will be there in both of them because that site is sending it only once. So if at that time PI is waiting for RJ, then it will show up in the resource status table as well as in the process status table. But suppose it is the case that PI is in site S A and P J is in site S B. So when I initiator takes the snap the status of S A, this edge will be shown by in the shown in the process status table. When it takes the status of S B, this will be shown in the resource status table. Okay. Only if it is shown on both of these, the process status table of S A and the resource status table of S B will the initiator accept this edge as a valid one, all right? Now let us see uh, first with our example that uh, what would have happened if we followed this instead of the original centralized algorithm. So let us recall what we were doing there. So we were having process PI. and resource uh, PI and let us say PJ and we were having resources R1 and R2. Okay. And first let us assume that all of these belong to different sites. So PI is in some site, PJ is in some other site, R, R1 is in some site, okay. And let us name those sites. So let us say that this one is site SA, this one is in site SB, this one is in site SC and this one is in site SD, right. Now remember our problem, our problem was that at one point of time, this one was allocated to PI and PJ was waiting for it, all right. And in another snapshot, we saw that PJ was waiting for, uh, uh, PJ was using R2 and PI was waiting for R2. That is how it detected the false cycle. Now let us see what is going to happen if you ask SC at this point of time, suppose you ask SA and SC at this point of time that what are your uh, resource and process status tables. So S SA will say that okay, at this point of time, I do have PI uh, waiting on R1 and R1 will also say that, right? If you take the process status table of SB also, it will say this, right? It will also say that, okay, PJ is waiting for R1, right? Now, let us say that when we, in the next snapshot, in the next snapshot, what do we see? we see that PI is waiting on R2 and this is waiting on this. Now at this point of time, if the initiator asks SD, SD will say that okay, I see that at this point of time, PI is waiting for 
this and P j is using R 2. That is what S d will tell the initiator, but then the initiator will double check this with the process table of S a and the process table of S b, but process table of S a does not show that, it shows that P i is waiting on R 1 or, or using R 1 and P j is waiting for R 1. So, this is not corroborated by the process table. So, therefore, huh? okay. the question is if you, if before this dependency was formed, if you took the snapshot of S A and S B, then it does not show that P i is waiting for R 2, it does not show that P j is using R 2, right. If you take the snapshot of S A and S B before this was created, right. At that time you will see these edges, okay. Now, when you take S D snapshot after this is formed, it will show it will not be corroborated by P i and P j, because P i when you took the snapshot of P i this had not formed. So, in the process table uh, process status table of S A this dependency will not be there. So, your algorithm will say that, that that is not a real dependency, right. On the other hand, if you say that I am going to capture the states of this after the this dependency has formed, but when this dependency has formed, these are already not there. So, P i will not corroborate this one, P j will not corroborate this one at that point of time. Now, this is intuitively the reason why you cannot have both dependencies. You cannot have the dependency which was there previously and the one which has come in later on, because the process status table is captured in one snapshot of that site. So, it cannot show both. So, the only way you can have a cycle is that that dependency is there at every point that you took the snapshots along the cycle, right. Then it is a real delay, right. What I strongly urge you to do is to write the proof of this, the proof that the one phase algorithm guarantees that there will be no deadlock, so there will be no uh, false deadlock, right. So, try to write the proof by contradiction that let us say that it detects a false deadlock and then you show that that can never happen, okay. okay. Now, going to the actual algorithms we will study several different types of algorithm for distributed deadlock detection. The first type that we will look at is called path pushing algorithms. what are path, path pushing algorithms? What we are going to do here is that we will look at the local dependencies in sites, okay. So, if you look at one site, suppose in that site, in site S i, I see that there are dependencies from T 1 to T 3 through T 5 and so on, right. This is a local set of dependencies and let us say that T 1 has acquired some resource in S j and T 5 is waiting for some resource in S j, right. 
and let us say that there is some T 9 waiting here in S j waiting to acquire that resource and then this uh, resource that T 5 is waiting for is being used by T 6 and T 6 is waiting on T 1. Right. So, this is how the whole distributed dead like deadlock is there. Right. What a path pushing algorithm will do is it will take this paths like this and push it to the other side, push it to the, the sites on which it depends or sites whose resources it has occupied. Right. When this is pushed to this side, S j will take that and then add it with this to see whether there is a deadlock. Okay, this is the philosophy of path pushing. Okay, we will see how the algorithm uh, does that. Then we will look at edge chasing algorithms. What is an edge chasing algorithm? Instead of pushing the whole path, what we will do is we will forward tokens along the dependencies and if the token comes back to you, then you have detected a cycle. Right? So, we are not pushing the entire dependency and we are not waiting for any particular node to become, uh, to, to collect all the information. We are just pushing the tokens around. So, that is called edge chasing algorithm. The third category that we will look at are called diffusion computation based algorithms. What is a diffusion computation? It is another name of the eco algorithm, eco kind of algorithm, it is a wave algorithm. Okay. So, here we will see how we can use a eco algorithm to de detect distributed deadlock. Okay. And the fourth one which is I think the one which must have occurred to you at the beginning itself is one which uses a global snapshot detection. Because obviously, if we are able to capture the global snapshot correctly, we can detect whether there is a deadlock. Right? The issues that there will be here is that each of these they will use slightly different models of resources. For example, the common the one form of acquiring resources is that <coughs> we look at the AND model that in order to proceed, I need this resource and this resource and this resource and I cannot progress until I have all of them, right. That is the AND model. So, if any one of them is not available and I have a cycle based on that, then the whole computation is deadlocked. Compare that with the OR model, where I say that I can work if I have either this or this. So, it is not that I depend on this particular resource. If I have this resource or this resource, then I can progress. So, that is the OR model, right. And the third model of resources is that the I need T i out of Q i resources. So, there are Q i resources available R 1 through R Q i and if I get any P i out of them then I can make a progress. So, their deadlock detection would mean that there is a cyclic set of processes none of which can get P i out of Q i. So, they cannot progress, right. That is the detection of the deadlock. So, because the models are different obviously, the algorithms for detecting the deadlocks is different. For example, in an AND model there is a deadlock in the OR model maybe 
it's not a deadlock because that process if it if you give it an option that rather than using this resource can you do with that resource and it says yes then the deadlock is broken right so depending on these models obviously the same algorithm will no, not work in all of these models right so these algorithms that we will see will use these different models and uh, give the solutions for them okay Mo models are dictated by the application so it depends on the actual application what kind of resources what whether you can do with this or this or you need both okay that's de dependent on the application okay so from the next class onwards we will start looking at each of these categories of algorithms